Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Harbor Discussions, you know what it is. Here at Soundstage for Disturbing the Peace, day two. Today, I have the wonderful opportunity to interview Sebastian from the band Regulate. Just say what's up. What's going on, man? Hang on. <laughs> I gotta run it back. Am I looking here? Am I looking at you? Uh, you can look wherever. He just got done, so okay. just got done performing. A little so. disoriented, but I'm good, man. <laughs> I appreciate the interview. Uh, fresh off the stage. Yes. Feeling good, though. How are you feeling same. about the performance? I'll do the little game after game interview, I guess. Uh, <laughs> the state, so I've been here one at a time. Me and my guitarist, my friend Body, we came down here from Brooklyn to see uh, Turnstile Glow On re record release. Hell yeah, nice. Two years ago now, I think at this point. Yeah. That's the only time I've been here. Um, That's a good show to catch while you're uh, here. It was, it was dope. Hell yeah. It was really amazing. Uh, so I had a little idea what the venue looked like, but the Biohazard's uh, drums are set up. So the, the amount of space between the edge of the stage oh, yeah. and the drums for us <laughs> is maybe maybe two, three feet at best. So it was a little, you know what I'm saying, I have to keep my my peripherals open to yeah, not bust my ass off stage. But no, it was a good set. Hell yeah. You know what I mean? People were getting worked up, ready for Biohazard, the main event. So Absolutely. And you were talking on stage about how much Biohazard means to you. So for sure. just go into that as much as you can, I guess, you know, when uh, you first discovered them. So you know, a, big, a big part of me getting into hardcore was YouTube. Yeah. I was obsessed with it as a kid, as I am now, as a almost 30 year old man. Uh, and I saw, you know, a lot of um, music videos, 90s bands, yeah. 80s bands, and, you know, Biohazard has some of the most iconic hardcore videos ever, and I was really drawn to those. And, um, you know, I, when I first got into hardcore, New York hardcore was the most attractive thing to me, I think, just because it was kind of like, you know, other guitar music I had heard that is influenced by hip hop and stuff like that. So, you know, the rhythm and the pacing of it really attracted me, and Biohazard, arguably, you know, one of the most hip hop influenced, you know, hardcore bands ever. So that's something I got into at a pretty young age, probably 14 years old. And it's just, it, it holds up very, very well all these years later. Um, I have Down For Life tattooed on my back. Hell yeah. You know what I mean? I, I seen them two other times um, before they started playing with Evan Seinfeld again. And the other guy that was playing bass at that time, he did a great job, but no one can replicate, you know, the original. So I was also lucky enough to see them at their first show back with Evan in New York um, last year. It was amazing. So to be able to play the same day as them, you know what I mean, is is pretty surreal, honestly. Hell yeah. I love that band. Um, and I know, like, early on getting into hardcore, one of the things you did was you were type. Do you ever remember what band it was? I know you were typing in a band that started with G into iTunes, right? And then you came up with Gorilla Biscuits. Do you ever remember what band it was that you were trying to look up? Yeah, it was, so the song was um, Sick Transit Glory Fades or whatever, the brand okay. new song. And I remember the, the letter G was involved in the name. I yeah. guess it was Glory Glory. I'm very bad with band names. Um, but I was looking for that on iTunes. Yeah. Back in the day, they had like a 30 second preview. And I, I don't know what actually I was typing in, but Gorilla Biscuits popped up. Gotcha. I listened to that because of the name. That's crazy. Going back to YouTube, I jumped on YouTube, typing Gorilla Biscuits. That's really where it started. So even still, it slips your mind like what it originally was. Yeah, and it was brand new, another band that I love to this day. You know what I'm saying? So it's all, it's all connected. It was, it was meant for me to, to be in this world one way or another. Absolutely. Are you still holding down being the fastest man in hardcore? You know what I mean? I, so I've had two uh, knee surgeries in the last year. Ah. I, I blew out my meniscus and my ACL in both knees. I had uh, surgery about a year ago on this one, surgery in November on this one. So right now, it would be unfair for me to say I'm the fastest guy in hardcore because I can't uphold the title right, right now. You give me six to nine months, it's a wrap. I'm coming back with a vengeance. Hell yeah. And I can't remember if I heard about this injury or not. Is that from getting off the stage? I, so I walked into FYA Fest 2022, I believe. Yeah. I walked in right before Raw Brigade started and said, what's up to my boys? You know what I mean? They started playing. Set was active. Mosh pit was active. Try to hit a little. So, so the problem is when you stage dive, you got to commit all the way. Yeah. I did it, and I usually do that nine out of ten times. I didn't commit this time. The upfront crowd was not very thick. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It was very sparse. So at the last second, I decided I was going to do a little head walk instead of a stage dive. Mm. And the hesitation fucked me up. So I did like a little one-two Frogger style, came down, landed on both my feet. But when I was doing an interview, when I, uh, when I landed, 
this my left leg just something bad happened. Yeah. And I blew out my ACL, my meniscus. Has the recovery gone okay for you? Yeah. So I had to wait a full year to get surgery because my insurance fucked me over. Damn. Um, so it healed, but not correctly. Mm. So with surgery and some PT, recovered. Then Sound and Fury, not too long ago, I blew up this one. So I'm just doing it all over again right now. I'm in the middle of rehab for this one. Gotcha. Um, I had this in my notes too. I, I do lots of research, so I might have mixed this up. Is it true at one point you said best whistler in North America? Yo, f I, <laughs> like no hyperbole or exaggeration. I'm one of the best living whistlers in the entire world. Definitely North America, the Americas, North and South America. Hell yeah. 100%. Got you. You could, you could check that. Ask, <laughs> ask about me, for real. Hell yeah. Um, I wanted to go into your like personal background a little bit. I understand sure. you were born in Colombia, right? Yeah. And you also have some indigenous background to you? Yeah, so um, my father's side... They're all still in Colombia, mostly indigenous roots there. My mother's side, African indigenous roots. Okay. So um, my entire family from Colombia born there. There's really maybe three types of people in Colombia, people who are of Spanish descent, European descent, indigenous people, and people who are um, related to people who are enslaved. So yeah. I, um, I come from the other, the, the latter of the two. Yeah, do you know like any specifics about your indigenous history? Like any tribe or actual people? Like is their name? Uh, not specifically. Okay. I mean, at large, maybe. You know, one of the great, uh, biggest indigenous groups, you know, hundreds of years ago was the Moisca people. Okay. And they kind of get left out of the, the story because you have the Inca, the Maya, the Aztecs, yeah, yeah. the three big ones. But the, the Moisca were, you know, huge. Um, and they, they conquered most of the western portion of South America, you know, Colombia, Chile, Peru. Um, but they didn't last as long as other civilizations. So a lot of the indigenous groups that are still around today come from them. So, you know, if it, if it came down to it, I'd have to say of Moisca descent. Okay. But it's hard to pinpoint because, you know, down the line, so many things happened, you know, yeah. in the whole exploitation and the whole you I got to say, you do thing. know your shit when it comes to history. When I, I was try. listening back to interviews and stuff, you knew a lot, especially when it came to, like, New York and things like that and how things kind of ended up the way they were like people getting pushed out of their neighborhoods and stuff like that you were very descriptive and you knew what you were talking about is history something you've always been into like in school and stuff like that is it something that you like actively pursue outside of music do you kind of watch stuff read Ab stuff yeah absolutely it's uh in school is always what I was drawn to the most geography, social studies, world history, all that stuff. No reason in particular, it just always caught my eye. My stepdad's a big history guy. We used to watch um, seven part World War II DVD series when I was a kid. I have a list in my notes app on my phone of YouTube videos I have to watch and most of those are historical things. Um, I went to school for film, but if I could go back and do it all over again, I'd definitely go back for anthropology or something like that. Um, another thing that uh, I wouldn't be able to find a job in, <laughs> but something I would have had more of a passion of in, in terms of studying. Do you have some like favorite YouTube channels and stuff for history and whatnot? Uh, man, you know what? If you asked me this five minutes ago, I would have had a list of you. <laughs> it's escaping me, obviously, now. Usually what I do is I, lately I've been into um, like really drawn out, in-depth explanations of like a country's, I guess, come up. So okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I recently I watched like a seven hour video about um, Ireland in parts. Okay. Right now in the middle of uh, Korea. Gotcha. Um, and you could say that it's useless information, but I mean, I get off on knowing shit. Yeah, yeah. I love no, talking definitely. about shit. Knowledge if, is power. If, exactly. If I pull up to trivia night <laughs> in this world history, you know what I'm saying? I'm crushing you. Yeah, it comes across, though, in a lot of uh, different barriers of life. Like, uh, you ever heard of Andrew Scholes, the comedian? Of course, yeah. So, like, he's known for, like, knowing all sorts of shit about different people's cultures. And, like, a lot of people would think, like, oh, how, why would a comedian need to know about history? But he uses it in his, you know, crowd work and stuff like that. So for sure. So I feel like that stuff carries over all the time, you know? If, if you're an artist, it, does, it only benefits you to know about history because you can, you know, you can use that as inspiration. If you're a stand-up like Schultz is, you know, it's a way to connect and write about different cultures. Maybe if you have some sort of inkling into, you know, where they come from and things. People like when you know about them. Yeah. You know what I mean? You feel seen. So in a comedy sense, as it relates to Schultz, like, if you can say something that only people from Scotland know or yeah. people from South Africa know, they're going to be like, wait a minute, this guy know his shit. So that is the same thing for, for music. Now, I'm not necessarily writing about 
you know, the Inquisition. Right. Or the Crusades. But, you know, if the song You and I is entirely about exploitation, genocide of indigenous people, and that, you know, I, w I wouldn't be as privy to write a song like that if I didn't know my history. You know what I'm saying? So. Hell yeah. Now, this is like kind of the main subject. <clears throat> Big hockey dude, right? Uh, yes. So... To say thank you for this interview, and I'm pulling a little Nardwar stick here. I got a <laughs> gift for you. This was lying around my house. Do the loot, do. Had no use for me. We have a wow. 1997 to 98 Dude. NHL record book Dude. from my man here. <clears throat> That's so fucking amazing dude holy shit yeah well i knew you were like super into hockey so and i knew i had some like old stuff lying around my basement my so man, dude. hell yeah thank for, you I, for this to be from the 90s too yeah yeah it's a um, dude holy i was trying fuck. to see if i had anything like specific to the islanders but um my family's like my dad and myself were born in colorado so we have a whole bunch of like avalanche shit. shit so i saw all that and i was like oh that'd be perfect dude, so, that's yeah, amazing that's just a transition into hockey holy moly um, Everybody should go and listen to all the other interviews you've been a part of. You've been a part of a lot. I've been a lot. Um, you know, I'm trying to think, you know, it's like Scoped Exposure and those podcasts. I always got to give them their due credit because sure. without them, I have no basis of research. Sure. Um, so a lot of people can go back and listen to how you got into hockey and everything like that. What I'm curious is like, what are your most recent focuses when it comes to hockey? And how do you continue to like push yourself and learn throughout the years? So... I mean, so I, I play, I played a lot before the knee surgeries. Yeah, yeah. I was playing three to five times a week, ice and roller. Um, my drummer and I play on a, a roller hockey team, two, okay. time, two time champions of the league. Let's go. Shout out to the Hoyt Hooligans, Astoria Queens. Um, it, it's, a, it's a real passion of mine. Uh, and on the way to the show today, I asked the van, like, if you could wake up tomorrow and be all world like all elite class of anything in the world, um, what would it be? And my top three is always skateboarder, guitar player, hockey player. I don't skate or play guitar, <laughs> but you don't gotta be big to do those things, pro. Uh, hockey, if I was the best in the world, I still wouldn't make it. But it, I just have such a passion for the game, you know what I mean? No one put me on. I really just turned TV on one day and was like, that's really interesting, I've never seen this before. I saw a video game, Drum McGinley on it. I was like, that looks cool. Um, it's a real, you know, homegrown interest of mine. I learn something new every time I go to the rink. Okay. You know, you meet a lot of different kinds of people playing hockey, a lot of deranged people. I think of some of the most interesting people are people that are really into hockey because it's a sport that exists outside of, you know, it's part of the big four in America, but it's definitely the, the forgotten stepchild of the four. Yeah. But to me, I, I don't think any other sport compares to it, really. No, not really. It's probably the only sport outside of actual fighting where there is fighting. And yeah. it's like pretty much like, all right. Dude, we, we don't have <laughs> fucking sanctioned fisticuffs like that anymore where it ends usually with some for, sort of like respect. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Like you yeah. squashed it. You know, that doesn't exist in most places in the world. <laughs> for that to be a part of a, you know, billion dollar institution is incredible. Absolutely. Um, so what do you like? What was the last thing you were working on when it came to like practicing hockey and stuff? Uh, so I, I, I picked up playing goalie. Okay. Because, you know, if you play hockey, you know that you can never have too many goalies showing up to an open skate or, you know, show them. So the guys I start. So after the pandemic is when I really started going hard with roller hockey. Before that, it was just ice, really. And I played with some guys in Astoria, Queens, a Hoyt Park. And we had this one dude who doesn't know how to skate. Okay. And he's got, like, the old Milek, like, Modell Sporting Goods goalie setup. And he's a great guy, but he's really easy to score on. And we have my boy Desmond, who is a really unreal hockey player, unreal goalie. So when the two guys show up to the rink, it's a little lopsided. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you want a little bit of challenge. So I said, you know, I'm kind of agile. I can do the splits. So I went out, went on Facebook Marketplace. I found this old Ukrainian guy. I bought his entire set, 500 bucks. Yeah. Good gear, dude. This guy used to I play I assume ice. that's a great deal, too. Insane <laughs> deal, bro. Insane. The, the, the gear was a little outdated, but it got the job done. Yeah. So I just kind of jumped into goalie because we needed somebody. And I got really into that. It's, it's like playing goalie is like a whole different door that opens up when you, you're already a hockey player. Gotcha. So, um, so yeah, it was just goalie stuff i would sit in my room and just put my my pads on drop into the butterfly for like an hour just to build that muscle memory you know okay. what i mean 
Gotcha. Um, what are some of your favorite rinks that you like to practice that regularly? Or you, you don't have to give them away if you don't want to, but just in general, like what are some of your favorite rinks and like what are some of the best rinks maybe outside of your area that you've been at? So I've, I'm not sure, I haven't played ice hockey anywhere but New York. Okay. Um, but World Ice is an amazing rink. Um, Cantiog on Long Island, the Islanders used to practice there in the 80s. Gotcha. Uh, which is crazy because it's a shithole. <laughs> Belmore, uh, Newbridge Rink in Belmore, New York. That's like the rink that I started like going to. I kind of I taught myself how to ice skate. Okay. Just go in there for like open skates with my friends. Another shithole, but like that's my shit, dude. Like a real old rink. Yeah. You got the fucking bubble hockey. The fucking you, you sit on the fucking bleachers. You get a splinter in your ass. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like. That's real hockey. But then also, I pra I've played and I practiced at um, Twin Rinks, which is where the, the Islanders' brand new state of the art, like two rinks in the bitch nice. facility. And it's like, you feel like you've gone pro when you play there. Right, so, yeah, yeah. The World Ice, Twin Rinks, Cantiag, um, where we play, where my roller hockey team plays, it's at Pier 2 in Brooklyn. Okay. Across the river is Manhattan. You, got, you see the New York City skyline. It's unreal. There's really no rink like that in the world. Gotcha. The, or like, it's right there, the, the skyline. It's, it's incredible. You can see a Statue, Statue of Liberty from there. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Nice. Um, is street hockey something that you ever got into? Does that actually, like, help translate to the ice at all? I would say so, yeah. So when okay. I play in Queens, in Astoria, that's all street hockey. So they have this. So it's like jungle gym, handball courts, basketball courts, um, another handball court. And then down the middle, you have this, like, really like smooth nicely laid like cement where like these dudes show up they play soccer in the morning 11 a.m they know it's time to pack up we show up with our nets we start skating around so it's like it's definitely street hockey it's on like some sort of like nice cement right um right. and there's no like out of bounds really you just play wherever and uh you got to look out for the sewer grates and shit and <laughs> acorns and random new york city shit so that keeps your head on a swivel you know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of gravel and a lot of pebbles and shit. Yeah. So you become a better skater. You know how to dip and dodge. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Stick handling gets a little better because you got fucking children running around and shit like that. So it makes you more aware, you know? Cool. Hell yeah. Um, so I understand you got into long distance rollerblading as a way to like keep up with hockey yeah. and the, the cardio and whatnot. Is that sure. something that you continue to do? So right now, again, because the knee, I can't. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. as soon as I can, I'm going to test it out maybe in a month or so. Okay. Just taking a couple laps. Um, yeah, that's something that I would do. I started that during the pandemic, early 2020. Um, there's a park by my house, Cedar Creek Park. There's a path, bike path, that goes really far down. Really far. It's about... 45 miles round trip, I'll, they extend it every now and then. So the last time I did, I did all 45 miles. Um, it's really a cathartic experience. And like, I'm just going straight for a long time and back, but yeah. you tap into some other shit in your brain. <laughs> like I don't run, I, don't not, I do not fuck with running. Right. But my friends talk to me about, you know, runner's high or whatever. I feel like I tap into whatever that's like, cause I'm out there, mm. I chew one piece of gum the entire time. It keeps me like, in a rhythm, okay, and I'm just somewhere else. You know what I mean? I listen to a lot of like drum and bass, like that shit, and I just got a rhythm. I don't go for pace. I don't go for speed. Steady pace. I try not to stop at all. Okay, and that really translates to really playing shows, going on tour because it's just a consistent cardiovascular, you know, uh, uh, marathon of sorts. I mean, 45 miles is a long fucking way. Yeah, definitely. That's like. Skating from where I live, past Manhattan. Yeah, that's, that's probably far. about the distance to my house, cause I and I live about an hour from here. You know what I mean? Word. So that's crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to talk about some of the other hobbies that I, you know, heard, listened to. I sure. think this was like you talked about this back, like when the pandemic was like still very relevant and everything. You were talking about uh, like flying drones and stuff uh, for like filming and everything like that. Yeah. Is that something that you stuck to? So like I said, I, I went to school for film. And by the time I graduated, I was pretty burnt out on it. But I was like, you know what? I still I have some sort of passion for filmmaking. I just want to do it on my own terms. Okay. So I would take editing gigs every now and then. Gotcha. But when it came to like actual 
filmmaking, whatever, making videos. I just like making like tour montages and stuff like that. Hell yeah. So right before the pandemic hit, um, you know, in America in a big way, we did a six week tour in Asia, Australia, New Zealand. I brought my little handheld camera and my drone and I was out there getting busy. Whenever I knew we were posted up somewhere scenic, I set that bitch up, flying it around or have it hover while I was filming the guys or whatever. Gotcha. Um, it was really cool and it was something fun to play with during the pandemic. Um, I would go to Manhattan and, yo, 11 o'clock, Manhattan on a Friday night, dead. Like, yeah. it will never, I've got, you know, fucking yeah. knock on wood, hopefully that shit never happens again. But it was insane. And I would take my drone, I'd be flying around Times Square, like some shit that you could not do otherwise. Yeah, definitely. Not a soul around. So it was really cool. Um, it's not something I've kept up with. Okay. I just kind of... It's funny because regulate we have like three camera guys. It was me for a while. Body got into it. He bought this cool little like film camera. He made his own like little tour montage thing. And now Jared, our other guitarist, that kid, he goes hard with the cameras. And yeah, I saw he has his own page for his yeah. stuff and everything like that. Fast Times 48 or some shit like yeah. that. You can go on to Regulate's Instagram. It's one of the like only accounts y'all follow. Yes. So. Yeah, he takes a lot of photos. Every time we go do a tour, whether it's a weekend or a month, Kid's got like two or three cameras. He's got the fucking handheld camcorder. He's honestly, he's very talented with it. He's got a great eye. Hell yeah. And um, I'm very grateful. We're all grateful because, you know, we're out here doing stuff that we're going to want to look back on. And he does a really incredible job of documenting all that in a really, um, you know, kind of bare bones but artistic way. Right. You know, so I'm very, I'm very happy that we have him. And he's, he does it on his own accord. We're not asking him. So it's cool, you know. Everybody benefits from that. Yeah, when I was like looking into the band as a whole and looking into his Instagram, his personal Instagram and stuff yeah. like that, I wanted to bring this up because I saw the Red Bull Regulate shirts. This dude had so many different posts about Red Bull and like foreign Red Bull. Can you kind of talk about like what that's about? Yeah, it's, it's just what it looks like. My man really enjoys taurine and guarana and whatever the fuck else is in there. It's good. You know, <laughs> yeah, Regulate yeah, fucks yeah. a Red Bull. Vladimir does not drink Red Bull. He's not a soda guy. He's... My, that kid's an alien. <laughs> He's on some other shit, but we fuck with Red, Red Bull. Jared is on a different level. He seeks it out in different countries. Yeah. Uh, we've been to Japan two times. People will show up to the show and give him different cans wow, of Red Bull. Okay, so it's known worldwide, dude. Wow. People, our friends in other countries will drink a Red Bull and tag him on our Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's really crazy, yeah. man. He's got a collection. <laughs> He's had them glass bottles, like some rare like extract they have in the Philippines or yeah. um, uh, Thailand. They make like little glass Red Bull shooters. Yeah. Um, I, there's really not much to say. He just really has an affinity for Red Bull. You think Regulate will ever get the official Red Bull sponsor? Yo, we would love that, man. Hell yeah, Red Bull. I'm going to tag him. We're going to get that shit going. Let's fucking get it going. <laughs> I, I have a friend. So Red Bull does this like ice cross. You yeah, know what okay. that is? A friend of mine that I play hockey with, this dude, Jairo, he does that. Hell yeah. And he's been trying to get me into it. So maybe in a couple of years when like, I trust my knees, I'll look into it. Hell yeah. But that will be my in to getting the Red Bull sponsorship for the band. Because, I mean, at this point, we're known as the Red Bull band. Yeah, it's I'm about surprised time. Red Bull hasn't gotten more involved with uh, like putting shows. Because like you Monster so. and all these other... Monster's doing it right. Yeah. They're getting out there. Red Bull, they get really can tap into a market. Hell yeah. We need a competitor. The, ener the, ener the energy drink space in hardcore is there's much to be attained. Definitely. I will sell out for Red Bull. <laughs> um, so another hobby is, uh, and you mentioned because you were agile, could do the splits and shit with gymnastics. And I know you kind of started off in your backyard doing flips and stuff like yeah. that. Did it always stay in the backyard? Did you ever go out to places officially, you know, go to like uh, whatever they call it? Gymnastic spots, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I wanted to learn how to do a backflip. I taught myself, it took me about 45 minutes. And then I kind of spent, I kind of lived in Richmond, Virginia for the summer of 2020. Okay. They have a, um, uh, uh, the name's escaping me, I wish I could shout them out, but they have a, like an adult gym class at this gymnasium okay. in a town called Goochland. <laughs> Uh, just outside of the outskirts of Richmond. I would pull up like every Monday and Wednesday, 9 a.m. for the adult class. And I would just try to hone in on my skills. There were some people there that were doing some like real Olympic style type shit. Like, like some shit like people should not yeah, yeah, yeah. be able to do. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I was out there just trying to knock down a back handspring. Um, but it was just cool. It was like, you know, 
I like testing my body, pushing it to, you know, its limitations. So, yeah, I, um, that's about the farthest I got in terms of my gymnastics okay. um, career. But it translated into, the, you know, when we play shows, I love hitting a backflip every now and then, you know. Uh, in a car wheel round off every now and then, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, hell yeah. So, I know you have sort of a little bit acting career. You were, uh, it was Dispatches from Elsewhere, right? Correct. The show with Jason Siegel. Yes. Um, I forgot what interview it was, but like I said, y'all can kind of go and uh, do your research and, because you've talked about that a little bit, sure. but I wanted to bring that up. I know things slowed up shortly after and, you know, things kind of, slowed because it was COVID, right? That kind yeah. of slowed everything down. Yeah. Do you still have any desires to uh, act? I, to answer your question, no. Gotcha. But I would have a desire if a project came to me and they're like, we really want you to at least audition for this. I'm open to it. But okay. with acting, with a lot of shit, like showbiz shit, you got to really invest in yourself. Yeah. And I, I don't have a passion for it. So I just am not going to invest my time, energy, and money into something that, like, I'm not willing to grind for. The That's dis The yeah. dispatches from elsewhere thing fell into my lap. You know what I'm saying? I got hit up. Hey, this guy needs his body double. Can you do it? Sure. Hey, actually, we fired him. You got the job. What the fuck? Yeah, because you had to, like, teach someone how to skate on that job, right? So our drummer, his dad is a stunt coordinator. Okay. Um, the kid, the character I played, originally, he is on quad skates like the old school rollerblades the entire time kid said he knew how to skate didn't know how to skate drummer called me he was like yo my dad needs help with this can you be the body double for this kid long sh like far out wide shots you'll be him when it's close up it'll be him right they're like you know send us photos show photos jason siegel himself not the two mile horn <laughs> said get rid of that kid let's just get this kid in they fired that kid i'm in philadelphia the next morning Call time 6 a.m. I'm in the, the fucking the sprinter going to set. I got the job. I'm in quad skates. To be yo, to be honest, I haven't skated in quads in years at this point. <laughs> and they're fitting me for them. They're like, you're good. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm trying to like figure it out. I was good. So that really fell into my lap. And I was like, yeah, I'll give this a shot. I did some other smaller things. Um, but again, it's just not something I have like a passion for. Right. But if you were like, hey, I got this script. You want to do it? I'd be down because it's fun. Yeah. It's the easiest job I ever had in my life. Yeah, I remember it's you insane. saying it's like people be saying it's hard. You're like, nope. Yo, it's <laughs> really not. Now, I had I had lines that they cut out. It's right. not like I was delivering this dramatic, award-winning performance. Yeah, of so course. you know, I'm sure Leo has it harder than me. But <laughs> you're pampered to a degree that is inhumane almost yeah like yeah. i don't need someone holding an umbrella over my head when it's right, yeah when i it's remember you away. tell the dude you're good that's he's crazy like, thank you he's like are you sure i'm like yo <laughs> you're like twice my age I, this feels weird for me i want to yeah, hold it yeah. for you but no I, I hey if you got a script hit your boy up if you expect me to put any effort into it otherwise it's not for me gotcha i'm curious if there's like any film any show that you could have worked on what would that be? And I guess just in general, what kind of scripts are you kind of like looking for? Like what would be of your interest? What genres of movie and shows do you like? I really would love, so I, right now I've been watching a lot of comedies. It just okay. feels good to watch a comedy late at night. Yeah. Um, and I wish that I could be that guy. I do not think I am funny enough to deliver someone else's lines and make it funny. I feel like you gotta, you got Yo, making people laugh on purpose is one of the hardest things you can do. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Stand-up comics are out of their mind. Yeah, and honestly, like, I think it, people confuse being funny and being able to do stand-up. Because, like, I can make people laugh, but it's always by accident. It's sure. It's like, I don't be meaning to. Sure. So, it's like, I get what you're saying. To actually go up and do it on purpose, yeah, it's a whole it's other It's an level. unreal talent, dude. Yeah. That's another thing I said. If I could wake up tomorrow and be all world, being an amazing stand-up comic... It's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, a comedy script would be cool. I would be very insecure about it. But a nice thriller, you know what I'm saying? Okay. I just rewatched one of my favorite movies, Prisoners, recently. Nice. Um, really just depraved, upsetting movie. <laughs> Some of my favorite type of shit. Hell yeah. You know what I mean? So, you got a nice, dark, dramatic role. I'm your guy. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Gotcha. Um, I understand you did some modeling as well. I don't know if I ever heard any specifics, so if you want to go into like some of the gigs that you had, and also a similar question, if you could model for any brand or anything like that, what would it be? So, 
like 2018 or so, 2019 maybe, um, my boy Jay hit up my girl Rebecca, great photographer. Jay works for Sakani, um, shoe brand, represent. Um, and he, he needed someone to model some shoes. I did that. Okay. Um, and my answer is also for that. Sakani is my favorite shoe right now. Okay. Amazing. They're doing a lot of collabs. You know, Raised by Wolves, J-Tips. They're working with a lot of really sick designers. Hell yeah, that's um, cool. I think it's an amazing brand. Uh, I've done that. I did something for Boombox or something box. They make, like, themed boomboxes. Okay. I, did, I modeled for, like, the DMX one. Rest uh, in I peace. I think I, Snoop Dogg probably had one of those, Snoop right? Snoop Dogg, probably, yeah, about. Motley Crue type shit. Okay. Um, did that. Uh, along with Sakani, I would love, yo, I would really love to be one of the people who models like new hockey jerseys yeah. like the Islanders Rangers Flyers and Devils all just put out a new stadium series for the outdoor games they're playing and they did like a like a tri-state like themed shoot and like subway stations and shit and these good looking guys six foot tall guys you know what I'm saying yeah. but I know they don't like hockey right. why don't you get some real yeah. MFers in there exactly I would love to model a hockey jersey you know what I'm saying? Or hockey gear. You know what I'm saying? I did, um, I was in a, I guess it's like a modeling gig. I did something for Sherwood and Jeff Staple, Staple Pigeon. Okay. They did a collab. Oh, that's sweet, dude. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, that's another thing that fell into my lap. My friend was like, hey, do you know a, um, uh, a hockey player of color? I said, me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Next thing I know, <laughs> 5 a.m., I'm getting picked up by a, a PA in the city. We go upstate. Like an hour upstate, <laughs> like it's like north of the Bronx. That's upstate to me. Yeah. Um, and we're Muncie, New York, somewhere upstate. And I'm hockey player of color one, and I'm modeling this like collab between Sherwood and Staple Pigeon. And um, now I'm correct. They're the ones that did like the pigeon dunks back in the day, yes. right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying, yo. People that don't know that shit's huge. That's that's awesome, man. That's like some if you know you know type shit yeah, yeah you know what i mean like they were big but now it's like a cult type of thing definitely but that dude jeff staple he was the ice hockey goalie for nyu when he went okay. and he's always of hockey and he's always he's always just wanted to make some collab cool. so we hit up sherwood and sherwood like hockey players out there that's like a lot of people's like first stick or gloves or sherwood okay it's like a good affordable like like real hockey players brand okay and they're trying to really tap into like younger people and do cool shit in yeah, my opinion yeah. they're the coolest brand right now they did a collab with pigeon they did a collab with ovo yes dude what? i wasn't yes. expecting that yo they're based out of toronto okay that makes sense so they're like using that and like the bigger brand ccm bauer you know what i'm saying they're not doing that they're doing the same old stuff and they put out quality products but like people Yo, hockey is an amazing sport. Yeah. It's not cool. It's not swagged out. Yeah, they just got to get that Supreme collab going. <laughs> it's Yo, it really is that easy. Yeah. And if you want younger people to get into the game and push the sport, you got to make them interested in it. You know what I mean? Definitely. And it doesn't help that it's so expensive. That's a different conversation. Yeah, yeah. But if you get kids interested because shit is cool, like, you're going above and beyond. So shout out to Sherwood Hockey. They're doing really cool shit. Shout out to Staple Pigeon. Um you guys ever need another, you know, hockey player of color oh, yeah, to model some shit? Clip. It's gonna be a clip. Let it's me know. <laughs> Let me know. They they actually hooked me up crazy after. I really will probably never have to buy another set of hockey protective wow, gear. Okay. They sent me a lot of shit. <laughs> nice. If you need a lefty hockey stick, let me know because they fucked up and sent me a lot of lefty sticks. <laughs> it's all right. It's all good. Uh, yeah, dude. Yeah, anything hockey related or shoe related, I would love that. Uh, so you're big into shoes and whatnot? Is yes, it like for sure. Like all kind of sneakers and stuff like that? Foam posits were my big thing for a while. Got you. So you I'm, have a grail sneaker for. that you want? Um, shit. I mean, Paranormans. Okay. Paranormans. Um, do you know anything about the lore of that? Sort of. Okay. There's a city morgue lyric where he talks about uh, taking a dude's Paranorman foams. So I kind of know. I know they, about it. They did so. a raffle for him. I okay. think there's like maybe... I could be totally missing the number. It's like 800 gotcha. or 8,000. Regardless, very rare for shoes. Okay. They did a raffle. People in the crew, production crew in the cast got them. But they're based off the animated movie. And they're crazy. And there's not that many. They go for $25,000. And it's one of them joints. Yo, yes. If I won the lottery, that would be the first. <laughs> I would buy a pair that has not been worn. Yeah. That's my grail. 
I really have every other pair of foam posits that someone could want in terms of grails. Hell yeah. Very lucky. I, I keep my, my ear to the ground, you Did know? Did you collect them, like, over the years and stuff like that? Yeah. I, I just, I'm in a lot of uh, Facebook groups. Okay. Um, I'm in, I mean, we're in Baltimore right now. Balt you know, this is Foam City, Baltimore and Hell D.C. Yeah. I'm in DMV, fa like, Facebook groups for foam posits, shoe groups. Okay. I got a lot, I've gotten a lot of foam posits from this city. Hell yeah. Um, do I have it correct? You played drums in a band called Affirmative Action? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you want, like, talk about that a little bit. And do you ever plan to experiment outside of vocals again? Uh, so Affirmative Action was first hardcore band I was ever a part of. It was my friends Armando and Tom, or Armando and Jenkins. And then this dude Tom, who, you know, no beef, my friends are me anymore. But I was the youngest one of the group. They're like, hey, we got a show coming up. We need you to play drums. I was like... I don't play that. They're like, that's okay. You got to figure it out. <laughs> Excuse me. We had like two songs and then we covered Straight Edge Revenge and I think Intro Changes by Floor Punch. And uh, the live set is is on our drummer's um, iPod. Gotcha. I think that's the Damn, only place iPod. it exists. Yes. <laughs> I think it's the only place it exists. Wow. Uh, it was cool. We played that one show. Um it was called Affirmative Action because we were all black and Latino. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a little tongue-in-cheek, but it's a, it's a cool name. If anyone wants to use it, feel free. That's all you. It's a sick name. Um, in terms of doing anything else in the band outside of vocals, I don't feel competent okay. enough to do that. I, yo, during the pandemic, is a funny story. I was like, you know what? I got all this time. I'm taking up all these hobbies. Let me, like, play drums for real. Because I never had a kit. I okay. would just play at my friend's house when it was time to practice for affirmative action. Right, right. Um, but I was like, let me get like a little like electric kit. You know what I'm saying? Something cheap. And then, you know, if I'm feeling it, build from there. So I go online. I find a $95 electric drum kit. I'm like, that's a steal. Hell yeah. What do they usually go for? Three something, Got four you. something. Okay. So that's a steal, right? Yeah, yeah. My man, when I tell you that the box was about the width of this book... And about this high. These motherfuckers scanned me. Damn. It was like a little, like, plastic. Uh, like a little desktop. Yes, oh dude. My God. But the pictures were a full-on electric drum kit, dude. That's fucking wild. That's what I get from buying some shit from, a, a, you know, an Asian country that I just, just not One reputable. Timu joints. Yes, dude. <laughs> FOMO. Yeah. Fimu, fake, <laughs> yeah, faux yeah, yeah. shit, yo, for I real. I get ads for like, they, they'll be like, zero dollars, zero shipping. I'm like, there's zero chance this is quality. Zero. No, and you would be right. You're <laughs> much smarter than me, my friend. I was riding the high off those unemployment, you know, COVID checks. Oh, everybody and I was like, was, fucking blow man. it back. Dude, I, I just, all I could do was laugh because <laughs> they really got my ass. Now, um, I, my mom, she likes to repurpose shit. She took them for her place and she just kind of, I think she filled them up with, dirt and she has little like cactuses growing out of them okay she's very useful like that gotcha so uh cool. may maybe one day if i ever got a real drum kit i'd get back in back in the throne you know hell yeah um i forgot exactly how this related to you i just have a i have a note about will lenium the will smith <laughs> will lenium and you really are on your nard war right <laughs> yeah man. yeah That's yeah, crazy. yeah um so i guess if you can remember where that came from explain but also um I, this was this happened a while ago but like what were your thoughts on that slap when it happened and everything like that? And was like the whole Will Smith thing just like a younger thing for you? Dude, my mom really loved Will Smith. You know what I'm saying? She was really like, like, okay, from what I know in Colombian media, there's not a lot of like black Colombians represented. Okay. So when she came over here, Will was popping. We came over yeah, in the 90s, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So she, Will, Denzel, Jimmy Fox. Those were like her guys, you know what I'm saying? So she was like, she loved any of them. Fresh Prince was her shit, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Jimmy Fox show, Steve Harvey show, that was my shit. So I think it was 1999, the turn of the century, and Will was doing a show outside somewhere in Manhattan, and I distinctly remember being there with my mom, and they were handing out or tossing out, or she bought maybe shirts that said Willennium. As in, you know, millennium. <laughs> yeah. And she still has hers. I okay. wish I still had mine. I was just getting ready to ask I that. wish. No, we still got one somewhere. Um, as far as the slap goes, I mean. <laughs> what was that like for your mom, I guess? Did she was a big fan. Did she say anything about it to you, like, I, when it happened? I don't think we discussed it, but <laughs> my mom's a pretty 
laid back person. I don't know if she would condone Will's <laughs> actions. I don't know if I condone Will's actions. You know what I mean? I'd say most people didn't. It's a little crazy. Yeah. Kind of jumped out the window with that one. Um, <laughs> he could have had words with Chris after. Will, uh, I mean, Chris took it like a champ. Oh, yeah. He ate that shit. He did. And he kept going on. I mean, that's just professionalism in class. Absolutely. You know, Will, Will was trying to stand up for his, his lady. I don't know if that's the best way to do it. She was probably more nah, embarrassed I than mean, anything. Oh, yeah. She wasn't like, oh, my God. What a man, you know what I yeah. mean? Well, I feel like like all the memes and stuff, she seems to be like the power of the relationship. So I feel like it wasn't even like she was embarrassed, but she was just like, that wasn't it. Right. You know no, what I mean? that's not what she wanted. <laughs> yeah, That's no. not what she wanted at all. I just wrote that down because, like, you know, I was listening at work to a lot of interviews and shit like that that you were in. And when I heard that, I was just like, oh, that's some niche shit. I'm going to write that <laughs> down. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, also, something that y'all used to get into were, like, hotel room shenanigans, fucking yes. them up and everything like that. Um, was that just kind of on the spot? If, like, if people go back and look into, like, the history of, like, classic rock, that was, like, super common. There's, like, all sorts of stories about legendary rock stars doing it. Was it kind of something that you thought of as rock star shit at the time? It was just on no, the spot, dude. just being... I mean, it's just, like... <laughs> so, like, growing up, I was a pretty, like, mild-mannered kid. I got into, like, trouble, like, that, like, Normal kids get into. Nothing crazy, you know what I mean? I've been straight since I was a kid, so I was never doing that shit, but I was other mischievous stuff. Yeah. It wasn't until I met the, my friends from the Jersey Shore that I really started getting into, like, dumb shit. And that's what right. I was, I mean, it was kind of late in terms of getting into dumb shit. I was, like, 18, <laughs> 17, 18, 19 when I okay. met those guys. And I started really hanging out when I was, like, 18, 19. I went on tour with Blind Justice, and I was like, you guys are like this, okay. <laughs> and uh, they're wild. You were, we're all almost 30, if not 30 already. So we've settled down, but I was really just riding the energy that they gave, and I gotcha. just was with it. And uh, I mean, any hotel room stuff, anything that we did from the years <laughs> 2015 to 2018, you know, it's just just riding the energy. Um, we never like it was never like throwing TVs out of windows. Yeah, no, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, if people go back and look into rock of history, course, yeah. people were going fucking ballistic. They were going crazy, but they had the money to do it. Yeah, yeah, like, <laughs> they had that Zeppelin money. We didn't, exactly, <laughs> we didn't have fucking money to do it. So any any damage we did, it was, we did it so we could, we, we knew we could cover it up. Right. Or it was, we could handle it ourselves. One, I'll tell you a quick story. We were maybe North Carolina or something like that, somewhere in the South. Okay. And it was regulating Blind Justice on a full U.S. tour. And um, Blind, <laughs> Blind Justice saw a dead raccoon on the side of the road. I heard about this. They picked yeah. it up, put it in their van. <laughs> we all shared a hotel room, two beds, oh and it was God. like, so five people in Regulate, two people switched over, so three. So eight of us and our, our, our merch guy, Ringo. So nine of us in a hotel room, right? Plus the dead raccoon. <laughs> That's ten. That's ten. <laughs> yo, it was so fuck. Yo, head... No snout, t tail. He's not fit on this table. Damn. He's really fucking big. If I had a video, I'd show you after this interview. That doesn't need. That's like gotta be. That, that seems like another animal. Almost. Yeah, it was like, something different. <laughs> that's crazy. That, it was that down south. It's like these Baltimore rats and shit. They're just fucking otherworldly. It's different, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, we we really wanted to bring it into the hotel room. Some people in the band didn't want that to happen. The thing is, I not, why. not all of us are like that. <laughs> Some people are like, back then, were a little bit more sane. I don't want the dead raccoon in the hotel room now for more than like five minutes. Right. Yeah. But there's something, and I, when I tell people these stories, they're like, it's funny, but like, why? I'm like, there's something about like suffering with I your friends. Get it. I mean, that's funny. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's a fucking dead raccoon in the hotel just, room. You're kind of boring if you don't think it's a little funny. It's funny, but like, people, <laughs> I understand why someone doesn't want that. Oh, but at yeah, the same yeah, time, yeah. It's funny enough for me to want that. Yeah, exactly. Even if it's just for the night. Like, I get, <laughs> it's fun to suffer with your friends. Like, this actually happened within the last year. I was on tour with a different band, no pressure. Someone threw up in the room, uh, on the floor, made themselves throw up, like, as a funny. Oh, wow, that's... And <laughs> Jesus. We, like, uh, Pat, he's the oldest one in the band. He's not like that. He's a cool, mild man. He got a 401k. Right. You know what I'm saying? Okay. He's not like that. He collects bobbleheads and shit. Hmm. He doesn't want vomit in the room. <laughs> but it's and he doesn't get it. And me, me, body, and AJ are the ones that are like, oh, it's just funny. You gotta let it happen. <laughs> he doesn't like it. 
And I understand where he's coming from, but on my end, I just want to laugh. I got Sometimes you, you got to make yourself vomit in the room <laughs> for a giggle. Better out than in. Exactly. Um, so is the whole band is straight edge, right? Regular is, yes. Um, so kind of talk about that. I know, like, it was you were kind of around, I guess, addiction and stuff as a kid and mm -hmm. everything like that, and that's yeah. what led you to be straight edge and everything like that. Yeah, I just came from a family, family of a lot of drinkers, I feel um, you. <laughs> pill addicts and stuff like that hard drugs and shit like that. So it just never really appealed to me. And honestly, part of it, um, even before I knew what straight edge was, I was afraid of like experimenting with shit, yeah. coming home and my parents got the slightest tinge, whiff, aroma, inkling yeah. that I had messed around with some substance. I was not trying to feel my mother's wrath on gotcha, that. It yeah. wasn't worth it. Um, so that coupled with the fact that I just really had no interest to experiment, it was an easy choice when I found out what straight edge was. And, uh, you know, it gets easier by the day. It was never difficult for me. Okay. Really no temptation there. It's like not something I think about. Something I like, I sh got the shit tattooed on my fucking stomach and on my leg. But yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I was pretty like hard line, so to speak, when I was a teenager. Like I'd go to parties and like fucking, if there was like a, people would make like punch. Like they call it jungle juice. Yeah, get a yeah cooler. Just mixing a whole bunch yeah. of shit up in there. I, yeah, yeah. I was a kid, I was pissing in that. <laughs> I was fucking with people's drinks and shit like that. Nothing crazy, like no, not dropping That's anything of drinks. Funny. I was going around pissing in people's drinks and shit like that, <laughs> oh and like God. spitting in people's drinks and shit. Because I was like, I was also in high school when I was like yeah. just fucking preps, I'm fucking straight edge right. type shit. But obviously, I'm not like that now. You know yeah, I, mean? I remember you saying on one of your interviews that you think it's kind of like beat for people who just say like. You know, oh, you do this, you do that. That's not cool. You like a balance of supporting everybody, even people who aren't straight edge, but they want to be and everything like sure. that. Sure, you know, yeah. And, like, my straight edge is, you know, rooted in, like, experience, but also compassion. Because, like, you grow up around addicts. Um, and you, do, you develop a lot of resentment and anger towards them. As you get older, your feelings mature. You know what I'm saying? You also develop empathy and yeah. understanding and you get older you have more life experience you understand why someone chooses to do the things that they do and like it's not as easy to just stop yeah so. no it, it, it's hard i don't I, I don't get into too much detail about this because that person in my family is still very alive and close i don't want their like reputation sure. very you know love them very great person everything um but for me it was it, it was a struggle because it's like someone you love, it's one of my closest family members. It's like, I have no choice really, but to love this person. They've provided for me all this stuff, but it's like you do, you kind of hate that other person that they are because it's not them and everything like that. Absolutely. It's, it's a fucking struggle, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's much better just to, with most things in life, just to like go into it with like, try to be understanding and give that person some grace. Yeah. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean you should negate your own feelings, but even if they're negative feelings, you should feel what you feel. But like, it's just, you just gotta, if you really love that person, you wanna give them some sort of chance. You yeah. know what I mean? So my straight edge is not rooted in like, hate and anger like the way it used to. It comes from much more understanding. It's stronger than ever. It gets stronger every day. You know what I'm saying? Just cause it's not rooted in, in you know, negative components of who I am it is still very powerful, it's still something that, like, I don't preach, but, like, I'm never going to shy away from talking about it or fucking yeah. being proud of the stomach tat, you know yeah, what I mean? Of like That's my shit. I love being straight edge, but, um, you know, I'm not an asshole either, and I understand that there's a lot to this world um, that goes outside of my scope, you know what I mean? Yeah. And addiction is not something I understand. You can't understand that unless you're an addict. Right. But I'm, you know, I'm a... Uh, I have my own perspective on it. I've been, I've been there with somebody. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's like an interesting topic because, like I said, you can feel angry about it, but at the same time, you want that person to pull through. Of course. No one knows an addict and they're like, well, I fuck them. I hope they die. Yeah, it's just like the you don't biggest really frustrating thing it ever. Is. You, you want to shake them. Absolutely. You want to give them a hug, but you want to fucking shake them, you know? Yeah, and it's like sometimes sometimes you have to be... Absolutely. You know, you have to set boundaries, and you can't, you of know, course. you can't sacrifice your own health and happiness for this person because sure. it's like... It, it, it sucks when you watch someone, like, destroy themselves, but that'll, that shit will destroy you if you're not careful, you know? Absolutely. Um, 
eh, if I think about it, I'll think about it. Uh, so the 48 with Regulate, I, I don't know if everybody knows this, but it's related because Jared's into K-pop and baby metal and stuff. That's kind of like the acronyms with that is sort of where it tied in. I'm not at liberty to speak on that. Okay. I don't know. I gotcha. It just, it just happened one day. Okay. Um, Who knows? That was pretty much all the notes I had. Is there uh, any like major announcements for the band and anything like that? Uh, new music, touring, anything like that? We haven't spoken about new music, but I did have a conversation with Ricky from Flat Spot the other day, and he asked about it, and I was like, hmm, you know, maybe an EP or something. Okay. Um, I like that a lot of bands are doing like these little like two song, three song things every now and yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. I think that's cool. Um, you know, the record's been out for over a year now, and. Uh, I think we want to keep pushing in the direction that we're going with that. Um, so maybe, I don't know. Okay. As far as shows and tours, we don't have anything lined up or, you know, uh, announced right now, but we'll pop up here and there. You gotcha. Know? I do remember what I was going to say now is cutting back to the straight edge. Do you have sure. advice for anybody that is maybe either like suffering from their own problems or they just want to take the further steps to become straight edge but maybe you're struggling like any advice for those people uh see it's hard to speak on that because i've never done anything right you know what I mean? yeah. so i don't know what that you know feeling is like to really want something like that but i mean just talk to your friends and try to be open with people anyone who gives you the t anyone who will make time for you you should make time for them yeah you know what i'm saying so talk to those people people that you feel the most at peace with, confide in them and, you know, let them help you. Um, you know, you, no, no one really gets better at difficult things in life alone. No. That's something that took me a long time to realize and that it's okay to like ask for help from your friends and your family and yeah. people who care about you. And uh, if you want to make a relationship with someone better, you can't rely on them. You have to do your best to improve that relationship you know your actions do have consequences good and bad yeah um so just you know believe in oh god i hate it. believe in yourself yeah but yeah. like you know there's a if you got a community the corniest around, things are usually true it's guys. true it's it is. it's corny for a reason because we hear it non-stop it, yeah. it becomes redundant but you know people have been saying it for ages because it's true yeah you know what i'm saying i feel you take the plunge you know reach out to the community you have with you whether you got one friend or a hundred like, if, if those people really bring you peace, you feel safe with those people, those are the people you need to confide in and really put your time into, you know? Yeah, hell yeah, absolutely. That was a great last note, I guess. That was all I had. Is sure. there anything else that I missed? Anything else you want to tell the people? Nah, man, this is a great interview. Thank you. Uh, great questions. I never thought I'd speak about Willennium <laughs> on an interview again. Uh, <laughs> this is a very thoughtful gift. I love this. Of course, man. I really like statistics. Oh, cool, hell yeah. No exaggeration. I'm on HockeyReference.com every other day because I'm always wondering what stats some fucking bizarre, <laughs> unknown, fallen by the wayside hockey player has in 2003 and uh i'm going to be looking at this book awesome like, this I, I hope so man very awesome yo it's fucking sick hell yeah amazing um what before i cut the uh, video where can people find uh, regulate and everyone else on social medias and stuff music's on all streaming platforms uh there's no merch to be found <laughs> online we have a, a big cartel we don't update it we when we play shows like one-offs we make 48 of whatever we have okay uh, we really stick to the gimmick. <laughs> um, so if you ever want a shirt, don't hit us up. Come to, come to a show, hit up a friend that's going to the show. Hit us up on Instagram, regulate NYHC. If you really want a shirt that bad that you like, maybe work, or some, work something out and be happy to send it to you. Hit us up directly. Uh, yeah, we're on Twitter and Facebook and all that shit. Hit me up on Crate, my favorite music reviewing application. It's got like 50 monthly users probably. Okay. Uh, and that's it, man. Awesome. Thank you again, dude. Hell yeah. That was...